some of you have been here before, and so you kind of know how this works. And so I'm going to just go over the rules a little bit because they're pretty straightforward, simple rules. Um, I'm going to try and keep my voice a little down because Jade over here is actually doing a reading, and so I just am trying to be respectful because it's hard to read when there's a lot of noise going on and stuff like that. Um, pretty much you can ask almost anything with a few exceptions to a few rules. Um, one of the things I try not to do in the middle of a uh, group setting is I try not to do um, dead people. Uh, because it's just too confusing because dead people don't follow the rules very well and they don't necessarily stand right behind you so I oftentimes don't know who they belong to and that's a little disconcerting. So oftentimes um, I'm, I, I get in the ship just sort of haphazard, it just sort of hits me or it doesn't and I, I can't really control it completely. So um, oftentimes if I have a dead person in my house, they're there all day and I don't know who they belong to until that person walks in my door and then they come in my room and I'm like, oh, they belong to this person. So it, it's not my, my best thing, it's not my specialty, but it will hit me every once in a while. But in a group, it's more confusing because I definitely deal with guides and angels and I can do that, but I'd prefer not to go into guides' names or things like that because it, again, it gets too confusing because I've got too many things communicating and talking. So um, the other thing I like to just not do in a group setting is to do auras. And so, and it's because you're sitting close to each other and so your auras start overlapping each other and so it also becomes hard to read and it's easier if it's just somebody by themselves. But other than that, you can pretty much ask anything you want. And we have a small group tonight, so that makes it really easy, so we can ask lots of questions. I try and go to one person at a time and let them ask two or three questions, then go on to the next person, let them ask two or three questions, and obviously, we'll keep going round and round as, as long as you want, okay? So it's like, I'll, I'll do my very best to cover everything all the way up to nine o'clock, and so with this size group, we can cover a lot of bases. Um, one of the things that I want to just start with and talk about is, um, is how psychics read. Um, I like to use this as an educational um, format also to help people understand when you go to a psychic that there's all sorts of different skills and tools and abilities which is what makes all the psychics really different and really amazing and very cool. So um, just because somebody does dead people, uh, which is mediumship, does not necessarily mean that they read other things. Like they may not um, be, a, be able to see the future, but they might be able to see dead people in the past. Um, just because somebody is a psychic doesn't always mean that they can read an animal, okay, like a pet psychic. So there are vibrations of energy, and every psychic is reading from the level of energy that they really understand, and there's psychics that cover a lot of bases all at once, and psychics usually have a map or a set of tools that they work with to kind of guide them. So in general, most psychics are pretty much channeling all the time, but sometimes sorting complex pieces of emotional information are so tricky that we use cards or numbers or um, energy or colors or guides to help us navigate that, to help us sort that. So um, uh, one of the things I like to just talk about is that no psychic is 100% accurate. We're doing our very, very best, but all of uh, the information is actually coming through our filters and our information of how we understand something. And I know that a lot of the psychics here that work at the Golden Raid, I mean, we all have that experience that sometimes something comes out of our mouth and we're like, gosh, that makes no sense to us whatsoever, but it'll make perfect sense to you. But it's hard for us to even understand it because it's not really coming through us and, and it doesn't translate to our own information. So sometimes we're like, okay, I hope that made sense and everybody goes perfectly, that made perfect sense. So we're a little bit, you know, fishing, you know, for energy, trying to find the thread and hold on to the thread and then be able to navigate the energy from there. So um, I believe everybody is a little psychic. Um, I believe that you can't really survive this planet without a certain set of good intuitive skills. So I think it's an automatic gift that you have that in ancient times you kind of had to know that the bear was coming up behind you. You kind of had to get a feeling that something was wrong and, and be able to lead into the energy. Um, but I think in modern times we don't always listen. So I think what happens is we don't pay attention, we don't listen. So psychics in general, we're trained to kind of pay attention to those little subtle things that other people said tend to miss a little bit. Um, but it's very nebulous and it's kind of confusing. So um, uh, in Buddhism, they talk about it as the twilight language. And so I like to think of psychic stuff like that, that I'm sure you've all had that experience as you're dreaming or you're going to sleep, you start to get these weird pictures or images. And, and sometimes they're prophetic and sometimes the pictures are related to an emotional thing that's 
what's going on for you. And so it's really tricky to translate twilight energy or twilight language um, into something that makes sense. Um, and so uh, I love being a psychic. I think it's a really wonderful thing. I love being able to support people and help people grow and open up. And I want everyone to kind of learn to be a little psychic. So um, when we're in these group settings, I kind of like to get you to pay attention. Like when somebody talks or asks a question, use it as a game inside yourself. Like when they ask a question, do you get an answer kind of fast? Do you get a hit right away? Um, and then does your answer match my answer? And kind of start to feel that out because I think we can read each other a lot more clearly than we realize. I think sometimes we are taught to socially be appropriate and not necessarily say what we actually truly know is that we're kind of trained out of it. So I remember when I was a kid that I had, uh, my mother had this dear friend and um, she was a really beautiful lady to me and I remember um, leaving, seeing her and I said to my mother, oh she is so beautiful, she is so beautiful and my mother was like, um, well, when you see her, what do you see exactly? And I said, rainbows. Can't you see the rainbows? Mm -hmm. And my mother was like, oh. She said, ah, yeah, I, I bet there are lots of rainbows around her. And she said, but the next time you see her, I want you to look at her with your physical eyes, not your inner eye. And I was like, oh, okay. And so um, when the next time I saw her, I looked at her with my physical eyes, and she was unfortunately one of those women who looked like a horse. You know, she had that really long face, and she wasn't pretty, and she was very, very plain. And I suddenly realized, oh, you want me to look at that? Oh, I don't think I want to look at that, right? So I made a decision at that point to not necessarily pay attention to that. Um, but I think socially we're taught to pay attention to that. So I always say don't judge a book by its cover because some of the most amazing um, teachers sometimes are hiding as beggars. You know, so they're hiding in, in interesting places and you don't necessarily know that they're there. So our stereotypes of what we think some enlightened person should look like um, don't always match. So um, it's always important to kind of go from your feeling of a person, from your gut, um, rather than how somebody appears in any moment. So um, lot, there's lots of stories of teachers actually trying to act crazy to keep people away from them um, so that um, they actually could have a boundary because otherwise they would just have flocks of people and no quiet time and no time to meditate. And so they would like go be crazy and act all strange and weird. And, and then if you stayed and didn't get intimidated by it, you actually had good enough intuition that you could feel beyond the image that they were projecting, you all actually got in, okay? So um, anyway, so I want to talk just briefly about how I'm going to be working today. Um, you're going to hear me say things like the guides say, and that means I'm actually hearing something auditorially. So and psychics are auditory by nature, um, and I will use that quite a bit. Um, then you might hear me slow way down. So somebody asks a question, and you might notice that I'll slow way down, and I might close my eyes a little bit, and I'm dropping in, and that's an empathetic channel. It moves more slowly. It's not as quick. Um, and that means I have to kind of feel into it for some reason, that I'm not getting a quick auditory answer, that I have to kind of slow down and feel into it. Um, I might use numerology, and I use numerology especially for timing. So numerology is really great. Like if you're asking a question of, when am I going to get a job, or um, when am I going to get a shift in consciousness, or when am I going to get married, or something like that. And I oftentimes will use the numerology as a guide point and I'll ask for your birth date. Um, and then I also will use cards. And so I'll use the cards to kind of check myself at times because sometimes when somebody asks a question, it's in mid flux. So, um, and that's oftentimes why you're confused too. So you can't figure out the answer because you're in a place where everything is shifting and changing. And so when something's in mid-flux, it's actually harder to pinpoint and grab a hold of because every little choice and decision that you make actually starts to change the outcome a little bit. And things can speed up or they can slow down. Um, the other thing is, is you have to kind of look at uh, how your personality is, okay? So sometimes um, people have personalities that they're just really, really open and they're really, really easy to read, just so you know as a psychic that people can be like an open book and they're really, really easy to read. Um, but you can actually block a psychic, um, which is why we use tools sometimes, because your fear can block us and so all of a sudden all we can feel is the fear and we know that that's actually not who you are, but then the fear is blocking us. You can actually also choose to block us, um, which means you can try and do trick questions and things like that. And, you know, most of the psychics were kind of used to that at a certain extent, but you can actually, it's harder for us to, to 
track that because we're kind of trying to work around your personality and then at the same time we have to get to the truth and so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, you can also have people that have personalities that are oppositional by nature. And so, um, so you know, I, I've read plenty of people that are this way that um, if I say to them, you know, they say, how long is it going to take for this business to work? And I say, six months. Well, they'll make it take six years, okay, so that they'll actually drag something out and delay it because it's their nature. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have to look at yourself and you have to look at your nature, like, do you speed something up or slow it down? So I'm one of those people that when any psychic says to me, oh, it's going to take a year, I know myself well enough now. <laughs> as soon as they say it's going to take a year, I have this thing in my head that goes, oh, shit, I want it faster than that. And so then it usually takes half the amount of time. Um, I have a client of mine that I've worked with her for 20 years, and so I know that she is like the super quick person. So the joke, of course, is that um, I'll say something's going to happen in a certain period of time, and it's, it's instead of weeks, it's days. So I know that at this point. I know that that's how her energy field is, but it's because I've worked with her so much. So timing as a psychic is one of the most tricky things because Timing is out there, but it's also about your personality, that whether you want something to move quickly or whether you want it to move slowly, and so you can delay things out. So I've had um, people who came in and let's say their relationship is not going to work, um, and they ask me the question and I say their relationship is not going to work, and they're going to make me wrong. They're going to make, make sure that that relationship works, and now they're going to throw every amount of their energy into that relationship to make it work because they want it to work. Their ego wants it to work. And then eventually even that relationship breaks down, but they've actually tried everything to make it work. And they come back in and say, well, you said that wasn't going to work, and I was going to make you wrong, and da 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 and it still didn't work kind of thing. So kind of recognize that, to me, 50% of being a psychic is being a psychic, and 50% of being a psychic is knowing how to say it to you in a way that you actually can receive and will make sense for you. So the other thing that I do with numerology is that I use the numbers sometimes to help me understand how you think and how you flow and how you perceive your reality. So an example would be somebody who has a lot of nines in the numbers, they're very feeling oriented. So I'm going to get your birth date and I might know that you might, and you might notice that how I'm speaking to them, I'm speaking to them a little differently than I was speaking to somebody else because they are a feeler, so I'm going to use their feeling words um, rather than visual words. So an example would be if somebody's very feeling oriented and they're saying things like, well, I, don't, I just don't get it, I don't understand, and it's really hurtful, and da 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 da. If I responded and I said, oh, I see what you mean. Can you see how that goes nowhere? It's like it's like hits a wall. So um, I will adapt myself so that I will try and learn how you perceive information, and I will try and work with how your brain is organized. And so the numbers will sometimes help me do that. I can also sometimes feel it in the energy. But again, I can make mistakes every once in a while. So you know, there's those little places that it's it's a real tricky thing. So um, so that's pretty much it at the moment now. Um, one of the things I just want to say is that um, if you hadn't noticed already, the energy is really ramping up right now. Has everybody noticed that? Does everybody feel like things are getting kind of intense? I hope so. <laughs> so um, what's going on is we're having a Saturn opposition Uranus that comes in on the 28th of uh, this month, which is just a few days away from now. And um, that's a pretty intense opposition and it's going to create a lot of stress and strain. Um, then we're going to have that opposition going into the T-square, which is going to be in May. And um, when it hits a T-square, you're going to get a lot of things popping off and problems and, and issues. On top of that, the end of May, the 28th of May, we have um, Uranus, which is the disruptor planet, going into Aries, the god of war. And you can actually feel this energy starting to happen. So um, just look at it as an example of the plane problem. Okay, so we've got the volcanoes and the earthquakes, and now we've got problems in the airline industry is a billion dollars in debt, and you've got um, all these challenges with the euro because Greece and Spain and Portugal are financially kind of in the hole. And you can see this oppositional, you know, Saturn, which is about hard work and struggle, and Uranus, which is disruption. So you've got disruption and hard work and struggle kind of going like this at each other. And um, even in the United States, you can feel how people are really kind of frustrated. <coughs> They're getting a little pissed off. And so people are getting to the point that they've kind of had it. Like, um, they're saying, oh, the economy's good. 
you guys know the economy's not really good, right? I mean, it's like, you know, everybody's cut back quite a bit, and everybody is being a lot more careful with their money, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's it's creating uh, a tension and a stress and a strain. And so that's going to accumulate in the summer. And um, there's going to be a point, there's going to be a breaking point where all of a sudden a lot of people are going to say, okay, I've had enough of this. That's it. Um, a friend of mine and I, we have this, we have this little um, game that we play that we're going to create um, a political organization. And the only thing we're going to say as, as in politics is just don't pick the incumbent. <laughs> it's like whoever the incumbent is, just pick somebody else, right? Because, you know, we want the old guard out of the politics and we want some fresh blood, fresh ideas, fresh energy in. So just like that's a far comment is we just want to say have sciences, just don't pick the incumbent. Let's let's get some fresh energy in Washington. Let's create some changes, some new ideas. Um, because it's hard when you've got the old guard and you've got all the politics and the you know people paying people on the side and you know we just need to change and that energy is going to continue to escalate. Um, the other thing I just want to add is in July um, there is, on July 26th, there's a big change in the Mayan calendar, which is a shift out of Kawak into Ahu, which is a big deal, actually. And so there's a big shift vibrationally in the energy, and the 26th of July happens to be one of the worst days of the entire year. So um, it's going to be kind of intense right there. So I'm telling you all of that not to make you panic, but to teach you how to separate your energy from the situation. So it's sort of like you are not the situation, but you will feel caught up in the energy oftentimes. The more intuitive you are, the more you're going to feel the pressure of that energy and the intensity of that energy and the heaviness of that energy. So I want you to kind of pull back and go, okay, so um, what I find for myself is um, at the moment I have this motto, and the motto I put in the catalyst for May, and um, I'm, I'm simplifying everything down to three principles. Um, the first one is exercise. The second one is, um, uh, uh, what is the word I use? Um, the, well, let's just go with exercise um, first. The first one is exercise, which means when the energy really intensifies like it is, what's really helpful is to move your body in different ways because the stress, um, I think we all pick up the energy that's all around us and we pick up energy from people all around us. And different forms of exercise actually knock loose different emotions and energy. So your body is actually putting all your past life information, all your past life wisdom, all your past life trauma and you're not aware of it because it's lodged in the body. And so um, what I try and do in times like this is I try and change my exercise around. So when the energy gets really intense, I definitely move my body because I need to discharge the energy that's getting hit on the planet and it's everybody. So I, I need to not hold it in my body and I need to move my body in ways that release maybe some past life energy and I up my exercise. The next thing is discipline. So the second one is discipline. Um, what I find is, in general, um, the hardest thing to do is to learn discipline of your mind. Um, I had a spiritual teacher of mine that when I was in my 20s, he said, there's no excuse for not meditating. There's no excuse for not you know, doing your, your inner work every day. And I thought that was a little harsh at the time. But now, being almost 50, I totally recognize what he was going for because it's so easy to get caught up in the emotional chaos of my mind, and especially being a woman with the hormones running like crazy in my body. I mean, my, my emotions can run amok, and it's sort of like this story that I start creating that just gets crazier and crazier. And I even know the story's not real, but I just kind of run it in my head, and it usually stops me from being effective. So I have to learn tools or techniques that stop my head from running everything about because my head will say, oh, you're not good enough, you know, who the hell do you think you are, nobody's really going to listen to you, you're not smart enough, I mean, my gosh, there are people out there that have degrees in psychology writing to write books, why do you think you can write one, right? So every one of us has these self-negating thoughts that are really not constructive. So what I find is that I have to do things that interrupt them. Now, um, for me, um, what interrupts them is some form of mental discipline. Now, that could be mantras, it could be kriyas, it could be meditation. It's anything that just, I prefer kriyas, and the reason I prefer kriyas, and kriyas is my head is really noisy. <laughs> so, a kriya, if you don't know what the difference is, is a kriya is that you do, say, a hand posture, 
and you sit in a sit position, and then you repeat a mantra at the same time, and you have to count at the same time. So you're in a position that you have to hold, you have to breathe a certain way, and you have to count at the same time and do the mantra. So what happens is when you have to do that many things at once, which by the way is really tough, um, you can't run your emotional game, you can't run the emotional chaos of your mind. And what that does is it stops you. And, and so when I'm running a mark and I'm doing something that's like, oh, you know, it's, the world's going to, this is going to be terrible, blah, 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 blah. Um, I just stop myself. I just, I'll sit down and I'll do five minutes of just breathing and a particular mantra or meditation. Um, there's lots of them, so you can find them out there on the internet, which is so cool these days. So um, you can find a lot of them in the Kundalini Yoga um, uh, websites, um, which are really good, and the 3HO um, foundation sites. And so um, this one in particular, so it's like, remember that, you know, you're, Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, there are the people. Um, this is that one, and so what you do is you just take your fingers and you put them together like that, and then you check, get your thumbs to come together, and you just lift it on your throat chakra, and all you do, this is a fire kriya, and the reason I suggest this one is that this will give you energy, and this happens to be the year of fire. And um, so the entire year, it's like it's to support energy and movement, and if you're feeling stuck, this is the one I always use. So, and what you do is you, rep you repeat satnam six times, and then you do lahe guru on the seventh time. So in one breath, you do four sets. So it would go satnam, 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 lahe guru, 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 then you breathe. And then you do it again. And so you try and keep your eyes open, just, but just barely, barely open. And you do that because, again, light coming in distracts your mind from going too much inward into your emotional body. So if you barely have your eyes open, it's like your eyes are trying to process something visually. And again, you can't go into your emotions. Like if you close your eyes, you can go deep into your emotions, right? So there's all these tricks that you can use to just stop yourself. So, um, and there's plenty of them out there. That's just one of them as an example to just kind of move energy in a different way. So like I said, the first thing when I'm stressed out and feeling overwhelmed my energy is exercise. Second thing is a discipline of my mind in any way that you can do it, you know, any way that you can do it. Um, my husband, um, he, he'll, he'll be sitting there and I'll say, what are you doing? And he says, I'm, I'm telling myself to stop it. And so um, uh, he's just like, stop it, stop it, John, stop, stop, stop. He just, like, that's all he does. He's just like, I'm not listening, stop it, stop, stop. And he'll do that, and it takes him, says, about 20 minutes, and then his brain will stop doing it. So, I mean, that's a good way, too. I mean, it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be some fancy thing. But I tend to have to do more than one thing because my mind is pretty strong and I can, you know, get carried away with my emotions. Then the third thing is um, actually love. And so, one of the things I like to remind people is that um, the only thing you can take with you when you die is the love that you've given to others. So when I'm in overwhelm and in my crazy state, I try and be loving to other people and I try and be aware to see love from other people that are giving it to me. I try and stay really present with the fact that there are people out there that are trying to be kind and trying to be nice in the grocery store and trying to give me a place in the line and I try and really be receptive and open to the fact that there are people trying to love me and be kind and to receive what's being offered, recognizing that we're all human and we're all failable and fallible and we're not perfect and sometimes